want to go back to Genesis chapter 7, and uh, that was an uh, appropriate song. Uh, ancient words, and yet they have something to say to us today. I, I, I've been thinking of that most of this week as I've been working on some of the messages that we're looking forward to, and I'm having a difficult time getting through Genesis because there is so much in there that says something to us today. That, that we need. And I, and I think this is one of those, those days as we look at Genesis chapter 7. And our prayer is that it will speak to our hearts, that, that God will reveal what it is that he has for us. Genesis 7, then the Lord said to Noah, enter the ark, you and all your household, for you alone I have seen to be righteous before me in this time. You shall take with you of every clean animal by sevens, a male and his female, and of the animals that are not clean, too, a male and his female. Also of the birds of the sky, by sevens, male and female, to keep offspring alive on the face of the earth. For after seven more days, I will send rain on the earth, 40 days and 40 nights. And I will blot out from the face of the land every living thing that I have made. And Noah did according to all that the Lord had commanded him. Now Noah was 600 years old when the flood of the water came upon the earth. Then Noah and his sons and his wives and his sons' wives with him entered the ark because of the water of the flood. Of clean animals and animals that are not clean and birds and everything that creeps on the ground. They went into the ark to Noah by twos, male and female, as God had commanded Noah. And it came about after the seven days that the water of the floods came upon the earth. In the sixth hundredth year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the seventeenth day of the month. On the same day, all the fountains of the great deep burst open, the floodgates of the sky were opened, and the rain fell upon the earth for forty days and forty nights. And on the very same day, Noah and Shem and Ham and Japheth, the sons of Noah, and Noah's wife and the three wives of his sons with him entered the ark. They and every beast after its kind, and all the cattle after their kind, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth after its kind, and every bird after its kind, all sorts of birds. So they went into the ark to Noah by twos of all flesh in which was the breath of life. And those that entered, male and female of all flesh, entered as God has commanded him, and the Lord closed it behind him. Then the flood came upon the earth for forty days, and the water increased and lifted up the ark so that it rose above the earth. The water prevailed and increased greatly upon the earth. The ark floated on the surface of the water. The water prevailed more and more upon the earth so that all the high mountains everywhere under the heavens were covered. The waters prevailed 15 cubits higher and the mountains were covered. And all flesh that moved on the earth perished, birds and cattle and beasts and every swarming thing that swarms upon the earth and all mankind. Of all that were on the dry land, all in whose nostrils were the breath of the spirit of life died. Thus he blotted out every living thing that was upon the face of the earth, from man to animals, to creeping things, to birds of the sky. They were blotted out from the earth, and only Noah was left, together with those that were with him in the ark. And the water prevailed upon the earth 150 days. When I was about 10 or 11 years of age, living in eastern Pennsylvania. We, we lived in a farmhouse that was about a, a quarter of a mile from a creek. Now, we had explored that creek. Uh, we knew where every fishing hole was. We, uh, that was our life. But I, I remember one fall, a, a hurricane came up the, the coast, the Atlantic coast, and for some strange reason, when it reached New Jersey, it decided to turn inland. Now, if you've ever been in that area, you know there's not a whole lot between the Atlantic Ocean and eastern Pennsylvania to stop a hurricane. It just swept right across, and we received the full brunt of the storm. I still remember my bedroom was on the, in the attic on the third floor, watching out the window that evening as the big old oak tree that was beside the house and the, and the maple began to sway back and forth and branches coming down and wondering which one's going to come through the roof first. <laughs> uh, both of them stood, which was good. But when we got up the next morning, we were amazed at the devastation. Not just the devastation, but that little creek 
that we could wade across just about everywhere, had risen above its banks, had come up to within about, a, about 20 or 30 feet from our house. And there was a bank there that, that stopped it, but uh, it, it was amazing. Uh, we watched ha uh, small houses and sheds being washed down that, that creek, smashing into the bridge abutments and so forth, trees coming down. The, the, the greatest thing about the week was that we didn't have to go to school. <laughs> All the roads were, were shut, trees were down, power was off, and we got to enjoy looking at the results of the hurricane. And we, we took full advantage of that week. But you know, as I thought about that, that was nothing compared to what Noah experienced. As the fountains of the deep were broken up, the fountains in the heavens and so forth, we can't even begin to imagine what he went through. And yet, as I read that, the amazing thing to me is Noah was safe. He was in the hands of God. And uh, you ever have those times in your life when trials come, circumstances overwhelm you, and you just feel like you're totally out of control? Nothing you can do. That's where Noah was. And yet, he was safe because he was in the hands of God. I like Isaiah 43. In the opening verses of Isaiah 43, he says, But now thus saith the Lord your creator, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they will not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be scorched, nor will the flame burn you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Think of that. When we walk through the floods, the fires, the circumstances that we just don't understand, that crowd into our lives at times, God says, I will be with you. He's with us through, through it all. We see that in Noah's story. And as we look at it, I want you to think not just of Noah, but maybe you're in the middle of a storm today. Maybe something has crowded into your life that you don't understand. Let's take a look and see what Noah learned from this experience. We want to begin, our first point here is the command that God gave. Very simply, God said in the opening verse here, it's time to go into the ark. E enter the ark. And, and uh, seems like a simple enough command, doesn't it? But I wonder if it was for Noah and his family, because it demanded in their part, I think, a step of faith. God was asking them to leave their comfort zone, to step into a future that they knew nothing about. That's not easy to do. And yet, I wonder how many times do, do we face that in our lives? They were leaving all that they knew for the uncertainty of the future. And the reason is obvious, God was going to send the flood in seven days. And you might wonder, well, why seven days? Well, I think it took at least seven days for Noah and his family to get organized in the ark. If you've ever moved, you know it's not an easy experience. You just don't move in and suddenly everything's in place. If you're like what I have to face we put the furniture where I think it should go, and then a few days later, I think it should be over here, and you move it around until finally you get it where you like it. Well, they, they, they had that responsibility. But uh, moving in, into the unknown still demands an act of faith on our parts. Times come, and sometimes they're forced upon us. Sometimes we, we make those choices. Uh, it may be a new location. It, it may be come upon us because of a loss of a loved one and, and all of the dynamics that go, go with that. It may be a marriage that breaks down or it may be an illness that hits our family and uh, we feel totally out of control and, and wonder what in the world is God doing in those times. So the command was obvious, go into the ark, but it wasn't an easy choice. And then as we look at the choice, verse 5 Praise the Lord, Noah chose to obey. I wonder, and I have to ask myself that, if, 
if I were in Noah's place, would I have been as quick to obey? Or would I wrestle a little bit with the Lord? Well, do you really mean now? Uh, you, you ever hesitate to take a step of faith? Uh, because you just don't know what, what's coming there? Or, or maybe by nature you're a procrastinator. You know what God wants you to do. And you're going to do it tomorrow. <laughs> and, and yet, sometimes tomorrow doesn't come, does it? Uh, Noah didn't have that long to wait here. Either he obeyed or there were going to be some serious consequences for his, his life. We read in the New Testament, Noah was a preacher of righteousness. And yet, only seven people responded to what he was sharing and what he was saying. Hebrews chapter 11, in verse 7, it says, By faith Noah, being warned by God about things not yet seen, in reverence prepared an ark for the salvation of his household, by which he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. It was an act of faith on his part and on the part of the seven others that actually went in with him. Most of you probably know the chorus, I have decided to follow Jesus. Right? We've, we've sung it before here. Uh, the last verse maybe is one of the most difficult of the chorus. It says, though none go with me, yet still I will follow. It would have been very easy for Noah to say, wait a minute, nobody else is going. Why, why should I go? Uh, uh, why should I be the crazy one? It, it, it's easy to sing that, but sometimes it's another thing to do it. I remember when we worked with the uh, Chilcotin Indian people. Because of their family structure and their animistic worship and so forth, it was a very difficult decision for them to accept Jesus Christ as their personal Savior and, and the implications of that. And yet, yet they appreciated the fact that the very first song that was translated into their language was, I have decided to follow Jesus. And they, they understood what it was like to go it alone. I, I remember some of the, the, the men that accepted Christ as Savior, the, the crowd would sometimes wrestle them down and pour alcohol down their throat because they had given up drinking and it set them apart from everybody else. There was a price to pay to go it alone, and yet they were willing to do that because they loved the Lord. As we think of Noah and the fact that only seven others went in with him, I can't help but think of 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2, where it says, it's required of a man that he be found, what? Faithful. Not great. But, but, but faithful. That's what God was looking for in Noah. That's what he's looking for in us. And sometimes we need to learn to leave the results with God. Uh, actually, Noah saved more than, than the seven of them. Uh, you and I are here as a result of his faith. And, and so it, it had a profound effect down, down through the his, history of mankind. We're a result of his faith. But we need, I think, sometimes as we take a step of faith to realize we may not fully understand the results today, that all that God is going to do through that. As a matter of fact, we may have to wait until eternity to see what God did through a choice that we made. You ever share Christ with somebody and have them walk away and wonder, did I waste my time or did I plant a seed? You're not called to save them. You're called to share Christ with them. And the, the rest is in, in his hands. We need to focus on eternity, I think, at times. It's great when we see God come in and work in a special way, but we don't always see that, this side of, of glory. I remember one time we did. We, when we were serving in Little Wet, British Columbia, we started a, a Christian school in the basement of the church. And the, the first year we had, I don't know, some 11 or 12 students. But uh, one of the students that came, his, 
his grandmother actually begged us to take him. We, we didn't really want to take him because he was trouble. <laughs> but uh, we, we, we did. Uh, he had some problems. He, he was supposed to be in grade four, as the Canadians would say it, but he was tested at, at a second grade level. Uh, and, and one of the problems that he had was he, he, he had a, a good mind. He, he was a cap could be a capable student. Uh, he did well in kindergarten and in first grade, but when he got to second grade, he had a problem with dyslexia. He would twist his, his letters around, and the teacher that he had did not recognize that. And she just ridiculed him in front of the class to, to the point where she even made him sit out in the hall sometimes, and all the other kids would, would laugh at him and so forth. He hated to go to school. His grandparents, he, he lived with his mother and, and his grandparents, and they had to literally pick him up and carry him to school to get him to go to school. And, and so here he comes the first day, and, and he had learned that if he could go into the bathroom and stick his fingers down his throat, he could throw up. And, and then he would say, I'm sick, I have to go home. Uh, he, he had the system down r r really well there. And when we caught on to what, what he was doing, we said, okay, you saying you can go and make yourself sick, but you're staying. You're not going home. And, and we worked with him. It took probably four or five months to get him to where he was really cooperating with the program. And by the end of the school year, he had caught up to his grade level. And, and the next year, he, he moved ahead and so forth. And we left after two years. So I always wonder what happened to Shane. Uh, we poured so much time and energy into his life. We were asked to go back to that church to help with the school 12 years later. And uh, we could only go for one year on a, on a work visa. And, and one day I'm walking down the street and here comes a young man walking the other direction and he stops and he says, Pastor Dan, he said, do you know who I am? And it took me a while to think, who is this young man? It was Shane. And he had graduated from high school. He had taken a, a, a technical training program. He had a good paying job. But I still remember the words that he said that day. He said, I don't know where I would be if it wasn't for you and the school and, and what they did for me. Uh, what, what an encouragement that is. But, you know, you wonder how many others, maybe you've touched their lives, you don't even know it today. Have to wait till, till glory. Uh, and, and so he made the choice, and, and he was a blessing to many more than just the seven there. But notice the consequences. Noah and his family were saved because of his faith. The world was condemned in verse 16. What We, we see that condemnation come when God closed the door. And I think that's significant. It wasn't Noah that closed the door. It was God that closed the door. I think there's a warning in that. In John chapter 14, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And back in John chapter 10, he spoke of the fact that he was the door. We come through him. And praise the Lord. Today is still the day of grace. Uh, second Corinthians 6, 2 speaks of the fact that this is still a day of salvation. God is patient, but we dare not presume upon his grace. There comes a time when God says, enough is enough. And that's what was happening in Noah's day. I heard of a young pastor in England that ministered in a, it was an old church, historic church, wasn't seeming to get anywhere, but one occasion he went and visited an old man, that, and the old man said to him, young man, he said, you're wasting your time. He said, we are old, we are set in our ways, we have resisted the Spirit for years, and the Spirit no longer speaks to us. He said, why don't you go to the young people and, and communicate the, the gospel to them? There comes a time, I think, when God no longer speaks if we continue to reject his offer of, of grace. But it, uh, the next thing I want to look at here is the chronology. 
we see, and we'll see more of this next week, but five times we have the exact day mentioned in, in these two chapters. I think we're dealing with the word of God here, and I don't think we can write it off as a myth. I think God has recorded this for a purpose. And God has spelled out the, the days for us for, for a reason here. I don't think God wastes words. When you take a look at that little book that we call the Bible, you wonder, couldn't he have told us more? Couldn't, couldn't we have a whole stack of books? But this is all that he chose for us. And, and, and if he put this in here, there, there, there's got to be a reason. I'm just going to skim the, the highlights of that. And remember, it's based on a 360-day year. In that, those days, they, I, I kind of like that system. Every, every month had 30 days. Yeah. <laughs> don't, you don't have to wonder, well, which ones have 31 and which one have 30? And, and what about February? Uh, no, they didn't do that. They, they, they all had 30 days, and then every once in a while, they'd add a, an extra time period in there because they knew it was more than 360 days in, in, in a year. But based on those 360 days, uh, our counting starts on the second month, the 10th day of the month, of the 600th year of Noah. Now, it's all based on Noah at, at this point in time. It doesn't take us back to creation. He's not dealing with what year it was B.C. It it's all, all revolves around N Noah at this point. But on the second day, the 10th day of the month, they entered the ark. Seven days later, the 17th day of the second month, the flood begins. When you come down to chapter 8 in verse 4, it's on the seventh month, the 17th day of the 600th year of Noah, that the ark rests on Mount Ararat. Think of that. They have been floating for five months, not knowing where they were going, not knowing where they were going to, to wind up, not knowing if they were going to wind up. Uh, five months they spend in that condition. That, that, that's a long time to wander and wait, isn't it? But, and, and yet, finally, the ark rests. You, you come to verse 13 of chapter 8, and it's the first day of the first month of the 601st year of Noah that the earth is dry. Nice birthday present. Yeah, yeah. Suddenly the, the earth is dry. A and yet, you get down to verse 14 there. It, they wait until the second month, the 27th day, before they come out uh, of the ark. That's 56 or 57 days that, that they wait. And if you look at it all together, they were in the ark for 377 days. That's a long time. That's over a year. Uh, can, can you imagine going into the ark today and not coming back till the middle of May of next year? No, we, we probably wouldn't want to do that. But that's, that's what happened. Why did they wait so long to come out? I believe they realized God was the one that said, go into the ark. And I think they were waiting until God said, it's time to go out of the ark. They didn't rush out. They didn't try to run ahead of God. They, they waited until God said it was time to leave. I think there's a lesson in that. Hebrews chapter 10 speaks of the fact, I think it's 35 or 36, that we all have need of what? Patience. Do you struggle with that ever? Uh, we want what we want. And we want it now, don't we? We, we, we don't like to, to wait. But it's amazing when you think of the timeline here. Uh, we're so programmed today for instant gratification. You know, we have instant potatoes. You don't even have to take the time to peel them and cook them. You, you just get that powdered stuff out and, and make your in a few minutes you have potatoes. Uh, we don't like to wait in a line, do we? How many times do you walk up and down in Walmart looking for the shortest line or try to figure out which, which line's going to go the fastest? Uh, now, now that you can self-check, it's, it's a little bit easier, but uh, 
we, we struggle with patience if, if we're honest with it, with, with it. We don't like to, to wait. And yet, they waited 777, 377 days in the ark with no idea when it would end and what the future would hold. Let me ask you a personal question. Are you in a trial? Have you been praying? And it seems as if God is saying no. Have you gotten impatient with the Lord? Or are you willing to wait and say, Lord, I don't understand what's happening, but I trust you, and I will walk through this with you. How, do you re how did you respond this week when your patience was tested just a little bit? How do we respond when, when a loss comes or, or an illness or, or a broken relationship when we don't know the end result? Do we wait in faith or do we get frustrated with the Lord? Isaiah 40 verse 31 says, they that wait upon the Lord shall what? Renew their strength, mount up with wings as eagles, they shall run and not grow weary, they shall walk and not faint. I, I, I like the, the three of them there. The, the young people can mount up with the wings as eagles. The mature adults can run and not grow weary. And us old ones can walk. <laughs> we, we, we can still do that. <laughs> God knows where we're at in, in, in life, and he knows what, what we need there. But, but are we willing to say, Lord, you know what I want, but I'm willing to wait for what you want? Are, are, are we willing to exercise that, that patience in, in the Lord? Well, that leads us to the catastrophe here. Verse 11, the fountains were broken open, the floodgates and so forth. And, and to be honest, we don't know all that's involved in that verse. What did God do? How did he, he do it there? Evidence abounds today for a worldwide flood and, and so forth. Henry Morris and John Whit Whitcomb has given us a, quite a work on that entitled The Flood. Uh, the, the evidence is there. Many societies have those f flood legends. I, I remember on one occasion hiking up a mountain in, in Alaska. Now, when I say climbing a mountain, I, I'm not into this business with ropes and so forth. I, I, I got to keep my feet on the ground. I'll go up any mountain as long as I can, I, I can be in control and have my feet on the ground. You know, don't, don't rope me in. I don't want any parts of that. But... Uh, we, 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 there was three or four of us were hiking up the mountain, and, and just as we got close to the top, we found some petrified trees. I, I would have loved to have brought some of them back with us, but uh, we're, we were crazy hikers in those days. We didn't even have a backpack. Uh, and, and so we weren't going to pack much in our, in our pockets. We also found up there fossilized sea creatures. And... and uh, you wonder, how in the world did they get up on the top of the mountain? Well, maybe God knew what he was talking about when, when he talked about the flood. There were some tremendous topographical changes that took place. We get a glimpse of that when we think of Mount St. Helens. Uh, earthquake blew up. What happened? Some tremendous changes took place. A, a, a huge canyon was carved out. Now, I, I have a a sneaking suspicion in, in the back of my mind, because you don't read very much about that in scientific texts today, that about 100 years from now, they'll be saying this took place millions of years ago. <laughs> <laughs> After everybody's gone that experienced it, they, they can rewrite history there. Don't ever underestimate the power of what God is able to do. He says in Ephesians chapter 3 that he's able to do exceeding abundantly above anything that we ask or think. If God asks you to do something, God will give you the power to do it. He is able to, to move mountains in, in our behalf. You ever wrestle with that text? If you have the faith the size of a mountain, you'll, or mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, and you, wouldn't you love to see a mountain moved? <laughs> But guess what? You can't move the mountain. Only God can. He, he, he simply asks you to have the faith in, in his ability. Well, that brings us to the, the next one is the, the comfort here. And I didn't read 
chapter 8. We'll come back to that next time, but I want to read 8 1 here. It says, But God remembered Noah and all the beasts and all the cattle that were with him in the ark, and God caused a wind to pass over the earth, and the waters subsided. Do you notice what he says in the beginning there? God remembered Noah. It's not that he forgot Noah. Uh, Noah was safe because God was with him in the ark, in a sense. But he also recognized his, his need. And in the midst of the chaos, in the midst of the flood, God was there. We read Isaiah 43 earlier. In the midst of the flood, in the midst of the fire, God is with us. So much so that the psalmist in Psalm 23 says, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Even in those moments, and even though we, we shrink back from the process, yet we know the end result. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. We, we can look forward to, to that fact. Andre Crouch gave us that song, Through It All. Through It All. I learned to trust in Jesus through it all. How is that a possibility when we think of all of the circumstances that we face and go through? Well, I think it's summed up for us in Hebrews chapter 13. In verses 5 and 6, he says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. He is right there every step of the journey with us. We are never beyond his reach, never beyond his care. We don't always understand what's going on. That's why he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, sometimes we have to walk by faith, not by sight. I don't know about you, but I'd rather walk by sight. I, I like to have all th everything planned out and thought through and, and get all my lists made out and so forth. And God doesn't do it my way. <laughs> he, he does it his way. Uh, and it demands faith sometimes on our part. But as we think of all that took place in this chapter, I think it takes us to the cross, our, our final point there. In Romans chapter 8, in uh, verse 32, it says, He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Think of that. If God was willing to give his son on the cross for us, we can trust him to walk through the circumstances of life. That passage actually begins with uh, 28, where we, and we're so familiar with that. We, we, we love to quote Romans 8, 28 for our brother, don't we? God causes all things to work together for good. When, when, when they're in the hospital, we, we share that verse with them. It's a different story when we're there, isn't it? <laughs> but uh, he does, he does. And, and we can trust him for that because he spared not his own son but delivered him up for us all. If you ever doubt the love of God, meditate on the cross. Meditate on what he did for you that day on the cross. The Apostle Peter in 1 Peter chapter 3 brings us back to the, the flood experience beginning in verse 18. Of, he says, For Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, in order that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in whom also he went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison, for who once were disobedient until the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. Notice that? Weren't just brought through the water, they were brought safely through. And we'll see more of that next week. Corresponding to that, he says, baptism saves us and so forth. And it, it puts the focus on there. It says, uh, not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who is at the right hand of God, having gone into heavens after angels and authorities and powers had been subjected to him. Now, I'm not going to go into all the theological difficulties of that passage. You, you can wrestle with that. Uh, um, another time, but notice God delivered, God brought them through. And as I think about that, I can't help but think of what Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 3. He said, in the last days, difficult 
perilous times will come. He said, as we approach the end of the age, it will be very similar to what Noah faced in his day. Do we need to fear? No. God is still on the throne. God is still in control, and God, just as he saw Noah and his family safely through that experience, God will be there with us as we walk through this life. I don't know when God's going to say enough is enough in America. I don't know what judgment may come. I don't know when Christ is going to return. We can wrestle with that, um, but it's in God's hands. And as I think about that, he, he said, you know, there's not going to be another worldwide flood. Next time it's going to be fire. Now that's hard to take, isn't it? But remember what he said in Isaiah 43, when you go through the floods, I'll be with you. He demonstrated that in Noah's life. If we go through the fire, he said, guess what? I'll be with you. You'll be safe in his hands. And I personally look forward to the Lord taking us out before that time comes, but if not, we're still safe. We are in his hands. We do not need to fear the future there. And so as you think of this particular chapter, the command, enter in. Have you chosen to enter into his grace? Have you accepted his offer that he has freely given to you? Have you accepted the salvation that he has made possible through the shed blood and the body of Jesus Christ? And then let's go a step farther as we think about that. Is he asking you to take a step of faith today? And yet he hasn't told you everything about that step of faith, has he? It, it, it always amazes me that so often God will ask us to take a step of faith and he does it one step at a time. It would be nice if he laid out the whole thing and, and, and said, this is what's going to happen. But he doesn't do that. He says, just take this one step and then I'll show you the next. Are you wrestling with a question of faith today? You know what God's been asking of you. You just haven't been willing to do it. Are you willing today, as you think of all that Christ did for you on the cross, are you willing to say, Lord, here am I, use me. I'll do what it is that, that you're asking me to do. We, he doesn't guarantee us what the consequences or the results are going to be. We may not know this side of glory, but that's okay. He, he is in control of those areas of our life. And then one other question. Are you in a storm today? Maybe a personal crisis, maybe a family crisis, maybe something going on in your life that you just can't handle on your own. How have you been dealing with that? Been worrying? Been frustrated with the Lord? Or have you been willing to say, Lord, I don't understand, but I'll walk through this with you because I know that you are with me. As, as we come to the Lord's table, I think it's important for us to wrestle with that because we're to come prepared. If we've been complaining, and frustrated and upset because God hasn't done it our way, maybe we need to stop and say, Lord, forgive me. Lord, cleanse me and give me the spirit of faith that I need to walk through this valley. Remembering that you're not walking through that valley alone. He's going to be right there with you. Invite him into that situation, whatever it may be, and watch what he is able to do, not what you can do, but what he is able to do today. Let's pray. Father, we just want to stop and as we reflect on what happened in Noah's life, in some ways we want to say thank you that we weren't there. We can't imagine what he went through. But yet we all face storms and trials. Give us the courage to believe that you are walking through them with us today. Give us the courage to trust you. And if you ask a step of faith or a step of obedience, give us the wisdom to say, yes, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name.